As a scientist and inventor of a technology that could potentially allow individual researchers to edit entire wild species, I wake up every day worried that I might be missing something profound about the consequences of the technologies that we're developing. The gene drive is genetic engineering at the ecosystem scale. The consequences are going to be very, very wide, very long term, and across many different life forms. Gene drive organisms allow human beings to do something that we've never been able to do before, and that's to engineer evolution. And that takes our intervention to the natural world to a whole other level. This is a technology that is intended to various extents to spread through the environment and to exist in the environment and to alter living organisms in a potentially permanent way. One would modify the organism first in the laboratory, but it will have the tools of genetic modification built inside. So when being released, they actually will do the modifications out in nature, out in the wild. C'est une technologie irréversible et c'est une technologie qui peut amener l'extinction, l'extermination d'un groupe d'êtres vivants. The risk highlighted by gene drive is that a single scientist can now build something in the laboratory that we believe will spread to affect entire ecosystems, which is too much power for any one scientist to have. Gene drive organisms are perhaps the most powerful and dangerous environmental application of genetic engineering ever developed, as they are intended to permanently genetically modify or even eradicate wild species. To safeguard against potential disaster, we need a critical, ethical, social and political debate and a thorough technology and risk assessment. We need to examine key aspects of gene drive technology, including its future applications, the possible ecological consequences, the societal ramifications, the lack of knowledge and uncertainties of the technology and of current research, as well as obstacles to risk assessment and the regulatory steps required to prevent harm. But first, we need to understand what a gene drive is. Synthetic gene drives are a new form of genetic engineering designed to override nature's normal rules of inheritance. In case of natural heredity, a mutation or a mutated gene will only have a 50% chance of being passed on to the offspring. CRISPR gene drives, however, force both the mutation and the gene drive mechanism itself to be inherited by the next generation, even if it is harmful to the organism's own survival. This means that up to 100% of offspring will inherit a particular, possibly harmful, genetic trait and continue to pass it on from generation to generation to generation. How does this work? A gene drive consists of the genetic engineering tool CRISPR-Cas9, sometimes combined with an additional new gene. The CRISPR-Cas9 gene is engineered into a particular site of a chromosome. During the development of sperm or egg cells, CRISPR-Cas9 becomes active. It identifies a target sequence on the opposite chromosome, where it will create a double-strand break in the DNA. The cell's own natural repair mechanism will try to repair the damage and in most cases will copy the gene drive into the break in the opposite chromosome. In this way, almost all the sperm or egg cells will end up carrying the gene drive, thus ensuring that nearly all offspring will inherit a copy. This process will begin anew with each generation, spreading throughout an entire population. There have been many promises and claims made that gene drive will eliminate infectious diseases or eliminate invasive species, for example. But these claims do not really stand up to closer scrutiny. I think there is too much hubris, too much uh, excessive promises of benefits that people need to be much more realistic, both about what can be delivered, but also about how little is understood about how these organisms will behave in the environment. The four main applications would be medical, um, agriculture, conservation, and what we call dual use, which would be military uses, for example, as bioweapons. The one thing we really want to avoid is for a gene drive organism 
to basically run wild, meaning like to behave very different than intended and us not being able to stop it. So worst case scenario, the technology does exactly what we want it to do, but we didn't understand that this would create uh, ecosystem collapse. For example, mosquitoes drives them out of a certain area and that we see an ecosystem spiral of collapse where we didn't understand that the larvae of the mosquito was feeding the birds and the bats and then we lose the birds and we lose the bats and we lose the dragonflies and we lose the fish because we didn't understand how it all hung together. Using chemicals, pesticides and so on is not good. Using caterpillar tractors to fall down whole forests is not good. But it's a different kind of intervention. There are many differences, but a biological intervention, the introduction of an invasive genetically modified organism in a gene drive, has very different consequences. You don't know how far they're going to spread. You don't know how long they're going to survive. Most likely they will be there for a long time. If we're using this technology to drive uh, traits that lead to sterility, to intentionally wipe out um, certain populations and certain species, what does that say about who we are and what kind of virtues or vices we're living uh, on the planet? For me, the greatest risk is that we are thinking that this will help us out of a situation or situations that we actually need to deal with differently. Part of the problem with gene drives is maintaining a system like industrial agriculture that system is, is dysfunctional. By addressing a small piece of this, like a, a single pest problem, we're ignoring all those other things and we're encouraging the same system to remain intact. We're not really addressing these underlying problems. One of the big downsides is the opportunity cost. So you're spending a lot of research money in this area and that takes money and resources away from more realistic alternative solutions to the problems that we face solutions that can be driven by people living in the areas who are affected by these uh, invasive species or um, tropical diseases. Le public doit comprendre que le forçage génétique sous le prétexte de lutter contre le palu n'est rien d'autre qu'une médecine coloniale. Parce que cette technologie qui est une technologie importée Ce n'est pas une technologie maîtrisée par les chercheurs africains, alors ça va créer une dépendance du système sanitaire des Africains par des multinationales. Et ça, ça nous inquiète énormément. Le public doit comprendre que l'Afrique a suffisamment le savoir et les chercheurs nécessaires qui peuvent trouver des solutions aux problèmes du palu la mise en place d'une bonne politique d'hygiène d'assainissement est la véritable voie pour venir à bout du paludisme. I don't support research into the kind of gene drive that requires only a handful of organisms to be released and then will slowly spread over generations to affect entire species for any application other than the eradication of malaria because only for that one is it possible for every potentially affected country to agree in advance. And so I don't think we should even run the risk of doing the research. Running the research itself can be a risk because it only takes a handful of organisms escaping in the wild to spread. The best way to ensure that gene drive research is safe is to never build the kind of gene drive that can spread to affect an entire species. Fortunately, it is possible, we believe, to build gene drive systems that do not spread forever, that will only have an inheritance advantage for a limited number of generations. The developers of gene drives will claim that they are finding ways to limit their spread, um, but those are really not proven in practice in the environment, in the real world. And I think despite the assurances of scientists, some scientists, that we, we can recall them, that has never been shown in the environment at all. 
there are proposals um, for mechanisms to undo the effect of gene drives, in particular global gene drives. They are currently all in theoretical models, so we don't know whether they would work and how they would perform. Even if they would work, uh, they would not be able to restore it back to the original population because all of them would leave a genetically modified population behind, which means they all have the inherent risk of genetic engineering and genetic modification in them. What's important to remember is what we're doing here is not just engineering an organism, but trying to engineer a whole ecosystem. We know we don't have the capacity to model, to predict what's going to happen in the future in a complex ecosystem. I am very skeptical that we will do anything near adequate risk assessments. The pressure in the public to limit those risk assessments, both for commercial reasons, to get a product out, or the pressure to solve a problem like malaria, will put pressure on not doing an adequate risk assessment. One thing we've seen and can learn from, I think, historically with risk assessment is that we haven't done a very good job with this kind of complexity. We have a long string of late lessons from early warnings. Whether we look at asbestos, whether we look at thalidomide, DDT, whether you look at organophosphates, endocrine disruptors, again and again, a new technology, we often have an early warning voice. They're being ignored and it's, it's being commercialized, it's being put into practice and the costs often are very, very high. And it takes a long time to mop up. From my perspective, what really is important to do now is have real good regulation on it. To basically put everything in place that is required in order to make sure that no disasters happen. Gene drive organisms pose specific regulatory challenges because of their very nature. Uh, for example, the propensity to spread likely beyond uh, national borders, as well as to persist in the uh, wild and natural environment. It's very important and critical that uh, legally binding international uh, rules are in place uh, to govern gene drive organisms. While we have decisions of the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, which are a good start, they put in place some precautionary conditions before any release of gene drive organisms into the environment. Uh, they need to be built on. We feel it's very important to really take that space and time to have a pause in the development of this technology and to be able to work out and discuss this need for international binding regulations. I think for now, we really do need to have a moratorium on any actual uses. We need to follow a strict interpretation of the precautionary principle. And, and in this case, that means because we don't know enough and because at least theoretically there is potential for substantial harm, we should not be going forward with these, certainly not beyond the lab stage. We would like to start from a different point where communities that have a problem, such as malaria, for example, can discuss the different alternatives about what can help to solve their problem and how that can be developed. So rather than saying we're going to have a technology, we want to know the risks and benefits of that, look more holistically at the problem. What I feel is really important is to make sure that we do not have further biodiversity loss. That we have functioning, resilient ecosystems, make them more stable, make them more resilient. And I feel that for that purpose, there is no need for gene drives. <laughs>